Go. Take away, Mike. I do. Now think of the winning game or two. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Thank you all for having me. Uh, I've timed my presentation a couple of times, and I have finally got it under 20 minutes. So I'm going to try to keep it that way. And I hope everybody can see my screen now. Yes, we can, Mike. All right. So on December 17th, 1925, a large ad in the San Antonio Light that began Skate on Real Ice announced the upcoming opening of the Crystal Palace, a new ice rink nearing completion adjacent to San Pedro Park on West Myrtle Street. San Pedro Park was the oldest park in San Antonio, dating back to the 17th century, and long a popular destination of residents and visitors for recreation. It was a fitting location for an ice skating rink. Joseph K. Tobin, owner of the rink, promised a place that was, quote, gay, glittering, chock full of joyful amusement, with live orchestras, vaudeville acts, ice dances, and daily public skating, including an Apache dance on ice. Tobin, an independent oil man, came to San Antonio from Los Angeles to ostensibly open the rink, though it is unclear why he chose San Antonio. The rink was designed by architect George Willis, who got his professional start as a draftsman in Frank Lloyd Wright's studio before setting it off on his own. Ended up in San Antonio in 1911. The rink's exterior featured a stucco finish with a dash of mica spar that gave it a glittering appearance, thus its name, Crystal Palace. Inside, it featured a 60 by 120 foot rink, a box office, a soda fountain, and seating for 1,200 in elevated opera chairs. Sidney Cornelius, who was the secretary manager of the Builders Exchange, Exchange, received a sneak preview of the rink, which reminded him of his days in New York. He returned to work and put out a call for former hockey players by posting a notice on the exchange's bulletin board. The response he received far exceeded his expectations. Seven people signed up the first day he posted the notice, and he quickly had enough interest to start staging the game. On December 17th, before the rink officially opened, the first ice hockey team in Texas took to the ice. The only record of this first skate is a brief mention in an article in the San Antonio Light updating its readers on the progress of the rink's construction. But while details of the skate cannot be reconstructed, do they scrimmage or even have sticks and pucks yet? The participants are known. Not surprisingly, most of the players came from the East and likely had some type of experience playing hockey. The original seven to answer Cornelius' call for players were Ted Poor and N.A. Snye from Wisconsin, Lee Broyer from Illinois, James B. Brown and Harry Warren from Michigan, James Aiken from Scotland, and Lawrence B. Cochran from Canada. Other players who joined the team later were William B. Goddard, an agent with Aetna Life Insurance, Ernest B. Rubsamen, treasurer for the Rydal Oil Company, Murray Harding, a waiter at the Riverside Cafe, and Ernest Starkey, owner of the Leonard Hensley Starkey Company. These guys were part of the house team sponsored by the San Antonio Chamber of Commerce, the first organized ice hockey team in the state of Texas. One of the most well-known players, at least in the local and national sports world, to answer Cornelius's call was Simon Cy Rosenthal, an outfielder for the Boston Red Sox. Rosenthal was born in Boston, Massachusetts on November 13, 1903. He played some hockey while attending Dorchester High School, but he preferred baseball, earning an invitation to the Boston Red Sox spring training in 1922. He toiled in the Eastern League before joining the San Antonio Bears in 1924. Before the 1925 season was up, the Red Sox bought Rosenthal's contract, and he made his big league debut on September 8, 1925. When the 1925 baseball season ended, Rosenthal returned to San Antonio to spend the winter months with his new bride, Josephine LaBelle. Now, scrimmages could hold interest for only so long, and a house team needed some other competition to maintain and grow interest. Soon after the Palace team formed, flyers from Brooks Airfield and soldiers from Fort Sam Houston formed teams to create a city league. On December 24th, the newspaper announced a 14 league to begin play on January 15, 1926, with the fourth being planned from Kelly Field, though they never skated the team. Lieutenant Thomas A. Jennings, who played some ice hockey at West Point, organized a group of soldiers to form the Army team, 
sometimes called the second division team and sometimes called the third brigade. Jennings was joined by Captain L.J. Ardiff, who played some recreational hockey in his hometown of New Brunswick, New Jersey, and Privates F. Howard, J. Marshall, B. Richardson, and M.P. Poulon. Though the first game was planned for January 15th, the league started a week late, and Army played the Palace team on January 21st, 1926, the birth date for competitive ice hockey in Texas. Fans attending this game were treated to an exciting double overtime game. After a scoreless first period, Ray Anderson from the house team opened the scoring, giving Crystal Palace a 1-0 lead going into the third period. The third period proved the most exciting as the teams exchanged goals with a late goal by Private Marshall tying the score at two and forcing overtime. After a scoreless first overtime period, Jim Riley, the last player to join the house team, came off the bench and scored two quick goals to give Crystal Palace a 4-2 lead. Now, a quick aside about Riley, who's pictured here, a fourth on the right, as a member of the 1917 Stanley Cup winning Seattle Metropolitan. Uh, to this day, Riley is the only athlete to play in both the NHL, uh, for the Chicago Blackhawks and the Detroit Cougars, and in Major League Baseball for the St. Louis Browns and the Washington Senators. At this time, he made his home in Seguin, Texas, a small town about 35 miles northeast of San Antonio. Riley was finishing out his baseball career in the Texas League and would play for various hockey teams in San Antonio and Dallas, depending on which Texas League baseball team had him under contract. Now back to the game, and sorry for the long color commentary. Stellar goaltending by Ernest Starkey preserved the lead, and Crystal Palace won the inaugural game 4-3. Major Ralph Royce of the Brookfield Flyers served as the referee for the game. A couple days later, the Fort Sam Houston team took on the Brookfield Flyers in the second game of the season. 850 people attended the game, witnessing an exciting 8-5 victory by the Flyers. Rosenthal served as the referee for this game, which proved to be especially rough with many penalties and a player ejection in the third period. It is not known how the crowd reacted to the violence of the game, but violence would be a common theme throughout the development of hockey in Texas, and a major marketing point to attract fans to games. The third game was played between the Flyers and Crystal Palace on February 5, 1926. The Flyers won the game easily, handing the Crystal Palace skaters a 9-1 drubbing. The newness of the game was quite evident in the game recap published in the San Antonio Light. The sports writer wrote that he was amazed at the speed of the players and how surprised he was that there were not more collisions during the game. The writer also revealed his ignorance when he repeatedly referred to the puck as a ball. By game four, played on February 12th, the novelty of the new sport appeared to wear off as the reports of this and the following games were limited to just a few lines in the paper. The final game of the City League was played on March 11th, with the second division handing Crystal Palace a 5 2 loss. Though no official champion was named, Crystal Palace and the Brooksfield Flyers both finished with three wins, though the Flyers played two less games. For reasons not known, the City League was fairly short lived in its first year. Perhaps players could not spend time away from their daily lives, and the teams could not skate full squad. Rosenthal, one of the stars, had to leave for New Orleans to join the Boston Red Sox at the spring training camp after the fourth game of the season, and the Brooksville Flyers had to give up the rink for the cockpit and the order to the fans. However, as the City League ended, a youth league was formed. After playing a few games, the big boys started coaching into some high school boys, and a five-team high school league formed. The San Antonio Academy, Main Avenue High School, West Texas Military Academy, Alamo Heights, and St. Mary's skated teams. Main Avenue and San Antonio Academy kicked off the youth league on March 20th. Led by their team captain, Dan Altgelt, who scored three goals, the blue-clad skaters of the academy squad defeated the crimson skaters of Main Avenue 4-3, to three, though it was a back-and-forth struggle for the entire 30 minutes. And note time the high school games played 10-minute periods, a half the time the adult games. Douglas Stevens joined Altgelt to provide all the scoring for Academy, while Edward Tobin and team captain Russell Davis supplied the scoring for Main Avenue. For the rest of the 1926 season, these five teams vied for the Elliott Dexter Cup as the best high school team in San Antonio. The high school league played games every Saturday, and the games continued through the month of May, with the regular season ending on May 21st when West Texas handed, uh, handily defeated Alamo Heights 6-0. 
The season ended with San Antonio Academy leading the league with a record of 4-1 and one, and Main Avenue a close second with a record of 3-2. These teams faced off on May 24th for the championship. It proved to be a hard-fought game, and despite having two goals disallowed, the Academy skaters prevailed in a 1-0 victory on a late goal by substitute Tar Button. Alt Gelt accepted the championship trophy, provided by rink owner Tobin after Dexter and his Thomas Cup never materialized. The game was an exciting finish to the first hockey season and a fitting end to the first year of organized hockey in Texas. The city of San Antonio took the hockey and ice skating in general as the Crystal Palace rink was full, was always full during public skates, and crowds that sometimes numbered over 1,000 watched the hockey game. Even the local public library got in the act, buying their first book on the topic of ice hockey, Thomas Fisher's Ice Hockey. But at this point, with only one rink in the state, hockey was merely a curiosity. Other cities would need to build rinks and form teams if ice hockey was to take hold in Texas. Hockey returned for the 1926-27 season with the same teams and most of the same players. The Crystal Palace rink reopened on October 30th, and rink manager T.W. Tarver announced that the teams could share in gate receipts, and those wishing to retain their amateur status could donate the receipts to their parent organization. Cornelius was named the high manager of all the hockey leagues in town. Despite the return of the same teams and players, there was one notable difference in this new season. This new season brought about the idea of an interstate league as Houston and Dallas would open rings in 1926, form teams, and encourage travel between the cities as the house teams competed. The season was cut short in February when the warm weather made it impossible to maintain the ice. San Antonians embraced hockey in these early years, reaching their nadir for the 1929-30 season. By then, the town formed the San Antonio Hockey Association to govern local hockey and sported 15 teams in three leagues, a commercial league, a senior league, and an academic league. They even sported two traveling teams, the Spalding Blue Streaks from the senior league and the Broadway Sporting Goods Rangers, sometimes called the Ice Landers, from the commercial league. They played regular and sporadic games against entrants from other Texas cities, as well as visitors from St. Paul, Tulsa, and the Kansas City. The Rangers, under the management of local sports writer Perry Winkle, or Ray McCarley, seen here at the far right, even formed a team that was scheduled to tour 35 cities starting in January 1930 to promote San Antonio and hockey. They were to start in Los Angeles, work their way up the west coast of Vancouver, across to Iowa, and then down to the Mississippi River. The roster of this traveling team, called by McCarley the state's first professional team, represented all of North America not only the obvious Canadians, but perhaps the first Mexican-born player, Jose Carrion. Their goaltender was Tony Burkle. Uh, Tony kept a very detailed scrapbook of his days playing hockey, uh, and I was fortunate that his grandson let me digitize that scrapbook, and it provided much of the information that's available in this presentation. It did not take long after the ice skating rinks were built that talk of forming a Texas hockey league began. Indeed, the first interstate games were scheduled before Dallas completed its rink and formed a team when Crystal Palace challenged the Houston Polar Bears to a game with the winner to receive $1,000. They played in Houston on December 11, 1926, though the second division team from Fort Dan Houston represented San Antonio in the first ice hockey game between Texas City. Houston won the game handily 16-2, and a Houston sports writer said that several hundred spectators, quote, Reaction to hockey was pleasant to behold, for they took to the game without a rainfall and greeted a new sport with open arms. There was no word on the $1,000 purse. On December 15, 1926, the Dallas Ice Team's Joe Gardner announced plans to form a Texas hockey league with teams from Houston, San Antonio, El Paso, and Dallas. A meeting was held in Houston on December 16th at the Polar Wave Ring, but no official from El Paso was present. At the meeting, Houston, San Antonio, and Dallas formed the Southwest Hockey Association with the league made up of three teams plus the Army team from San Antonio. Harley Davidson, manager of the Polar Wave Rink, was named chair of the committee to write the bylaws of the new association. D.C. Bell, manager of the Ice Kings, was named the vice chair, and H.T. Swan of San Antonio, the secretary. Despite the interest that some had in ice hockey, the idea of a formal league proved to be mostly a pipe dream coupled with games between the three cities. Uh, El Paso did not build their rink when travel could be arranged. 
the three teams, San Antonio Rangers, Houston Polar Bears, and Dallas Ice Teams, played a series of games that some sports writers call Texas League games, but there appears to be no formal organization. The Polar Bears, despite the lack of a star player, proved to be the strongest team, winning 10 games over the season and losing only two, including winning the final game of the season against Dallas on February 16, 1927. The next three seasons were even more difficult for the league, with San Antonio skipping the 1928-29 season, and then Houston missing the next two, two years. In January 1929, Joe Gardner announced plans to form the Pro League in 1930 with teams from Dallas, Fort Worth, Tulsa, Oklahoma City, and Kansas City if Fort Worth would build its rank. He traveled to Kansas City and Tulsa in April to drum up interest, but again, the league did not materialize. Later that same year, retired lightweight boxing champ Benny Leonard tried to form a league that would include Dallas, Fort Worth, Tulsa, and Oklahoma City. He was trying to get a rank built in Fort Worth and planned to take over the Dallas team as well. Leonard was the majority stockholder of the Pittsburgh Pirates in the National Hockey League and wanted to develop talent for his team. While Leonard's plans were for naught, the Texas teams continued their informal league. The San Antonio Rangers played Dallas in January 1930, winning game one, five to two, and taking a 4-4 draw in the second game. A return trip in February resulted in a 5-2 win by Dallas and a 3-1 win by Dallas in the final game, for Dallas to claim the professional ice hockey championship of the state. Texas hockey enthusiasts would try two more times to get a league off the ground. Before the start of the 1930-31 season, D.C. Bell of the Ice Palace Auditorium in Dallas announced plans for a four-team league with entrants from Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, and Tulsa, with a possible fifth in Oklahoma City. The five-team league was mostly a two-team league, with Dallas led by Captain Mo Smith, and San Antonio, now led by Jim Riley. Tulsa made a brief visit to the state, playing games against the Ice Kings and Rangers, but they only made the one appearance, and neither Texas team traveled to Tulsa. The next year, Jack Cannon of the Dallas Ice Kings wanted to put together a Southwestern Hockey League. He visited Tulsa while playing with the San Antonio Rangers in an exhibition against Tulsa. Wichita, Kansas, and Fort Worth were planning rinks, and the idea was to create a league with Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, Tulsa, and Wichita. But this plan, like all the others, never bore fruit. Many great achievements come on the heels of many struggles and failures, and such is the story of bringing professional hockey to Texas. Even the American Hockey Association tried for multiple years before they were successful in introducing pro hockey to Texas. AHA officials visited Dallas in November 1936 to investigate the city as a site for pro hockey in 1937. The AHA had a vacant franchise and were investigating several cities. They considered Dallas's livestock arena a good choice for a venue. A few local businessmen considered applying for the franchise, but when they met with park officials and learned how expensive it would be to build a skating rink, they backed out. Three more years would pass before the AHA successfully placed franchises in Dallas and Fort Worth, making professional hockey in Texas a reality after 14 years. While those early attempts never resulted in a formal league, these early enthusiasts paved the way for professional ice hockey to take hold in Texas. Now, despite being the birth of Texas ice hockey, San Antonio would not get its first professional hockey team until 1994 with the arrival of the Iguanas of the Central Hockey League. While professional hockey overlooked San Antonio in favor of Dallas, Fort Worth, and Houston, ice skating proved popular. With two military bases in the San Antonio area, the Iceland managers could rely on a steady stream of northern transplants to keep the rink operating, if not at a profit, at least at not too big of a loss. The rink was also quite popular with area youth, some who learned to skate as participants in the academic hockey league, and some who would wander over from the neighboring park. In the early 1950s, a group of students, led by Ruben Gabriel Curran, formed the San Pedro Iceland Skating Club to put on an occasional show and give lessons. Curran went on to become a nationally recognized ice skating coach, having two of his pupils compete at the 1976 Winter Olympics, Wendy Bird and David Santee. The Crystal Palace of San Pedro Ice Rink closed on, November, on March 27, 1961, making it the longest running of the three earliest Texas ice rinks. But ongoing maintenance costs proved too much. Manager Hilton Weicker blamed the demise of the rink on television. 
saying the best shows came on in the evening when the rink made its most money. After school skating was still popular, but it was not enough to pay the bills. Fewer people came to the rink and the profits disappeared, forcing Wyckett to close the doors for good. Thirty years would go by before ice skating would return to San Antonio when, in 1991, a new rink opened off of Interstate 10 near Davisvalle Road. The new rink, perhaps as an homage to the past, was called the Crystal Ice House. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, it's a fascinating history in, uh, in Texas. Uh, we were The SIR group was fortunate to uh, have the full meeting there uh, a few years ago. And you really start to see the uh, passion for hockey in Texas that, that has been rekindled with the, uh, with the Dallas Stars. Uh, it's an exciting time. Yeah, the, I, uh, I had hoped to attend that meeting. I had a family emergency come up that, that prevented me from going. I really wanted to be there uh, when y'all came to Texas. Next, next time, next yeah. time, Mike. It uh, it was really a, a enjoyable uh, event. Yeah. Uh, pretty special for all that were able to get there. So, um, just checking the the chat box. I think you must have done a pretty good job because nobody's got questions for you, Mike. Uh, 